Loving Father, amen. And Lord, these words that we sung, may they be the expression of our heart. May this desire to give our lives to you, to trust in you, to surrender, and, and to know that you are the leader of our lives, but you are such a good leader that we want to follow you. I pray, Lord, today in this service, in this time, as we have the opportunity to be in your presence, that we might hear you speak to each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. I can invite you to be seated unless you are a father. It is Father's Day, and so why don't we show appreciation just for the men in this room who are fathers. And um, let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, um, we come before you and we give thanks that we call you Father. And while no earthly father is perfect, and you are, Lord, we give thanks for all the ways that our own fathers look something like you. And Lord, we not only give thanks, but we want to pray and intercede. One of the most important things for our world is for fathers to be fathers and for mothers to be mothers. And today, as we honor and celebrate fathers, Lord, um, we pray that you will equip all of these men uh, to be better fathers. But Lord, we don't pray only for us, but we pray for our world. And so, um, may you raise up fathers who look like you. And may you help all of us uh, become a little bit more like you. Help us to not... Um, Fall into the temptations to be a bad father, but give us strength and courage and goodness and understanding and wisdom uh, to be the fathers that you call us to be. And so, Lord, we give thanks and praise, and we lift up our dads and all of these men in this room and fathers around the world, and we pray for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. I may be seated again. We are ending our series today on um, humility and talking about choosing humility. And I want to start by telling you a story. And just so you know, it's a well-known story, but it does feel like a little bit of a dad story, like a story that a dad would tell. One fine summer day, a grasshopper was hopping about, happily chirping along without a care in the world. And then an ant passed by with a large ear of corn to its nest. The grasshopper continued to sing and dance. It watched the ant scurrying back and forth, carrying large burdens on its back. And the grasshopper couldn't understand why the ant was toiling so hard on such a beautiful day. The grasshopper finally teasingly went over and asked the ant, why don't you come and sing with me instead of working so hard? Well, I'm storing food for the winter, and I think you should do the same. But without a moment's rest, the ant quickly rushed back and the grasshopper simply ignored. Why bother? It's such a beautiful day and there's plenty of food. And so the grasshopper went off and you know this story. Now, as it goes, summer soon ended and winter crept over the land. It turned bitterly cold, frost covered the formerly green fields, and with nothing to eat, nowhere to hide, the grasshopper felt the painful pangs of hun hunger and soon feared for his very life. Shivering, he saw the ants in an ant hole, and they seemed cozy and warm, and he could hear merriment, and they were eating comfortably from their stores of food. Now, this is an Aesop fable, and it has derived many different morals. But my favorite comes from a 1768 retelling, and this is what they said. 
And in your frolic moods, remember, July is followed by December. Now, like I said, it sounds like a dad story. It also sounds like a Game of Thrones story. Winter is coming. Of course, it also sounds like a Jesus story. In Matthew chapter 7, we hear the words of Jesus. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the, steam, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it's had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Storms will come, winter is coming, and testing will happen. The novelist James Lane Allen is credited with observing adversity does not build character, it reveals it. How you handle the storm, what you do when winter comes, what that moment does is reveals what's in you. In the story of the ant and the grasshopper, winter's arrival only revealed what was already there. One prepared for the imminent difficulties ahead and the other who refused to learn until it was too late. Last week, we talked about the tricky task of choosing to cultivate humility. How do we participate with the Holy Spirit's work that Christ is going to be formed in us? How do we seek humility and not become prideful in our own humility? And last week, we focused on the fact that we do have a part to play. We can actually join in this process. We can train we can train ourselves even in the way of humility. Winter is coming. Be prepared. Who you are, what you choose, it matters. Jesus invites us. He calls to us. He woos us. Come and follow me. And in it, there's a certain way of life. It's, you've you've got to follow. Walk in my way. And when we talk about choosing humility, when we talk about choosing the way of Jesus, it really means listening to and believing. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Do not think more highly of yourselves than you ought, but in humility consider the needs of others before your own. It is better to give than to receive. These are all words of Jesus that all point in this same direction of living a life of love. I want to offer you three reasons to choose humility as a way of life. As a way that we follow Jesus, a way that we cultivate his character. They come from 1 Peter chapter 5. I'm going to begin reading for you halfway through verse 5. Now, Peter was writing to a group of followers of Jesus who were beginning to experience the winter coming. They were experiencing pressure, heat, persecution, suffering for their faith in Jesus. His advice sounds a lot like what we heard from Paul last week in Colossians. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. Because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. And to him be the power forever and ever. 
Amen. I want to start at the end, and I'm going to work my way back to the beginning of this little passage. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory, after you suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Steadfast To him be the power forever and ever. The first reason I want to offer you of choosing humility is that humility means choosing God's glory. Now, we may not see it as clearly, but the humble way of Jesus was right at the center of the contest between the claims of Jesus and the claims of the Roman Empire. What we sometimes miss is that there was a huge challenge of idea and commitment and faith between what Rome was claiming, because Rome claimed to offer peace, Caesar claimed to be the savior of the world, and then when we start hearing that, we can start to hear some of the overtones, but what was at the center of everybody's life in the ancient world was the pursuit of glory. And Jesus offered glory but it was a glory completely different than the Roman world. Whose glory do you want? What empire will you build? Will it be Rome or will it be the kingdom of God? What race are you going to run and what prize are you going to pursue? Do you want the applause of Rome or of the world or of the United States or your parents or your teachers or your employers? Or do you really want the applause of Jesus Christ? The whole ancient world was running after glory. But it was a glory shaped by Roman values. And then Jesus came and he offered glory, but something completely different. The book of John's gospel, I said this a few weeks ago. The first half of it is called the book of signs. It's about the miracles. We should expect that God wants to do things in our lives. The second half is called the book of glory because here is the place where the glory of God gets revealed right there where Jesus is lifted up on a cross. And that was the place that the entire ancient world believed there was no glory whatsoever. Both Jesus and Caesar offered glory, but they were radically different but they agreed we should pursue it we should seek it we should shape our lives around it but what Jesus is saying go after the real thing not that which is fake in some of the most famous words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 seek first his kingdom and his righteousness All these other things will be given to you, Jesus says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Seek first his kingdom, and Peter's trying to bring this home to those who are suffering, and he will make you strong. Seek first his righteousness, and he will help you to stand firm. Clothe yourselves with humility. Put on the way of Jesus, and you will become steadfast. One of our great summaries of the Christian faith is just a simple answer to a question. What is the chief end of humankind? What is the chief end of man? What is the chief end of woman? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Now, Peter's writing and he's lifting up that we might participate in God's glory, that it's right at the center of who he is. Seek first his kingdom, his righteousness. It's ringing in the background when he's talking about glory. And just because you're in the middle of the storm right now, it doesn't mean you're outside of God's embrace. Just because the foundations are being shook doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. Jesus warned us that things like this are going to happen. It's not if the storm comes, it's when the storm comes. Winter is coming. But in the light of it, we now face it with Jesus. Life has conquered death. We do not face the storm from a position of defeat, but of victory. When Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, it was in the context of him saying, don't worry. 
Don't worry about what you will eat or drink or what you will wear. The pagans are all caught up in those things and they run after them. You have a good father in heaven. And he knows all that stuff. You don't have to worry. And you see, Jesus is trying to lead us into a good life. And it isn't a life defined by anxiety. It's defined by seeking first the kingdom. Being set free. To to pursue glory, but glory which lasts. To pursue that which is real and good and true. You and I, if we confess that Jesus is Lord, if we believe that God raised him from the dead, if we've made that confession, we are followers of Christ. And it means that you and I are on mission together. Don't worry, start living. Embrace the good news. God is for you, he's with you, the Holy Spirit lives in you. The Spirit wants you to dream dreams. That's one of the signs of the kingdom of God coming upon us. Go big, make a difference. Be partakers of the glory of God. And one of the things that I want to share with you today about the way of humility is that humility doesn't shine the spotlight on us. It shines it on others, but most of all, it is what we do in response to God. What does it look like for us to seek first his kingdom? It means beginning to dream and prioritize kingdom realities. I want to put forward to you that one of the things that God wants to do in your life is he wants to make you passionate. And he wants to give you dreams. And he wants you to make a difference in this world. I want to share with you some of my dreams for us as a church. I want to be a church that breaks down the stereotypes of a post-Christian culture. You and I stand in a very difficult place as far as in the history of bringing Jesus to people. We live in a society that thinks they've been there and they've done it. And there's a whole bunch of people who have been in the church or been part of the church or, you know, at least descendants of people who were in church. And they see those things and they think that it's been tried and found wanting and they've let it go. And this is why I'm absolutely convinced that it is going to be a humble church that will be the reason or part of the reason why we win the witness to this society. Instead of being known for what we are against We will be known for who we serve. One of the exciting things is is that this is something that Westside is living into and has for for, for a long time. We tutor children who are struggling. We help refugees and immigrants become part of our culture and help them learn a second language and become citizens. We are helping feed children and their families who are struggling to make ends meet. With our partnership with the school district and Marcus Whitman in particular, the school is excited. I mean, I I, I read a letter this this last this this last spring, and you know we've been in COVID and all of this stuff. But a teacher sent a letter um, to Pat Reich, who's leading the charge with um, Bite to Go, and and she was talking about her experience of Westside as an outsider, and she says, you know, there's lots of churches that talk the talk. But what you guys are doing is you're walking the walk, and it makes a difference. But we can do more. We shouldn't just rest on our laurels. We shouldn't be satisfied. Every one of us, every one of us has a part to play. I hope that we're known to being a church that embraces breaking down racial divisions. Have you been to that church on Wright and Lee? It's not a white church or Hispanic church or a black church. But man, I went there and it seems like every tribe, every nation, every people group. And I know, you know, the Tri-Cities is not the most, you know, heterodox as far as just different people. But still, we can live into that. We could be known as a church. Ben shared this um, a a few weeks ago that helps people get out of debt and medical debt would be one of those things. 
We could be a church that, you know, concretely helps a hundred families in, our, in the Tri-Cities just turn things around. We could be a church that helps single moms and single dads develop skills to help their children flourish. I want to be a church where they go, they aren't hypocrites there. They walk the walk. They don't claim to be religious. They claim to be disciples. They didn't just say they believe or they didn't believe just because they were told to believe. It was a place where I could ask tough questions and they didn't get mad. And they wrestled with those questions. And they made me feel like I could belong. And some of those people would be uptight, arrogant, type A business executives. Some of them would just be stay-at-home moms and dads. And some of them would be convicts and drug dealers and sex workers and potheads, five-time divorced moms whose children are all removed by the state. And at the heart of it, I hope what people would say about us is that we're a passionate people. That I always thought that Christianity was boring, but I came around these people and they dreamed dreams. And, they, and, and it wasn't just one person, but it was like all these different peoples and they tried new things and they made a difference. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Humility means glorifying God. It means serving his purposes. One of the great stumbling blocks to seeking first the kingdom of God is fear. Peter knew this firsthand. When he took his eyes off Jesus, the second person to ever walk on water began to sink. Peter bravely declared to Jesus that we're willing to lay down our lives for you. And then just a couple of hours later, because of some angry stares and accusations, he went to denying his Lord. Peter knew that if we focus on fear, we will fall. And so he writes, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the face because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. The world around us is changing. The fabric of our society is fraying and being torn apart. And one of the options for us is to be a little holy huddle to create a safe harbor where we can feel safe and just wait until the storm blows over. We could do it, but it's not our call. You and I are called to be part of the greatest rescue operation that this world has ever seen. We're called to go out into the storm I don't know if you've ever heard of the term safe and sound, but that is the willingness of rescue ships to go out to those ships that are sinking because they've gone through the storm and they're torn apart and they're beginning to, to sink down. People are going to die. And there are two parts of the rescue operation. First, you've got to go and get to the ship, and then you attach it to yourself, and then it's safe. But then you got to go and then you take the ship back to harbor and then you do the hard work, which is picking it up and then making it sound so that it's seaworthy again. The call of humility is about choosing love instead of fear. And it's love over the long haul. I mean, there's that one part where, you know, like somebody's in danger and your adrenaline gets up and you go and you, and, you know, and you're willing to put yourself in harm's way. And that's part of it. But sometimes the harder part is what you do over months and years. And humility continues in the service. It's not the short term fix, but it's the long term fix. And then finally, humility means choosing God's favor. All of you, clothe yourselves 
with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he might lift you up in due time. I've said this, oh, I think, over and over. I mean, I, I, I sometimes get in that place where I don't want to be a broken record, but I believe that you responding to the call of humility and beginning to follow Jesus in this humble way is how we live and experience our faith in Christ. I'm going to tell you two stories because, you know, there's this part where it can be very scary. It, it's, it, it, is, it is a different value system. It is a different way. It's, it's a long game. It's not a short game. It's trusting in God's promises. And many times it's going to feel like foolishness. But there's a couple qualities that, that lead you to put your faith in somebody. And, and this is the part where this whole thing, I mean, Peter's coming and he's talking to people. And this is real suffering, real danger, real threat, their way of life. And he's coming and he's saying, clothe yourselves with humility. Go the way of Jesus. Live this faith out. Because if you do, if you're willing to be obedient, if you're willing to do this, you put yourself low. Don't worry about yourself. God knows you don't have to worry. He knows. And then he'll pick you up. But there's some qualities, if, if you're going to live that, that you need to see. And um, it's Father's Day, and, I, and so I thought about this, and I have a couple stories about my dad. My dad wasn't perfect. You know, he, he had anger issues, and sometimes we walked around the house like on eggshells and you know, so he wasn't perfect, but there were some qualities in him that shaped the way that I lived. And, um, and so uh, one of them comes out of, I know that he cared about me, and I knew that my dad was competent. I mean, I knew that he could rescue me. So here's one story. This is one of my favorite stories. I mean, it's a little thing, but it, it was, it's, it's a dad story. So... Uh, my dad would, on the weekends, we, we would have projects. And, and so it was this thing where it was like I was there and I'd be part of the project. And then sometimes we'd like go someplace and we'd have to get stuff. And so he had a motorcycle. And so I'd jump on the back of the motorcycle and off we would go. And oftentimes it was really boring. You know, we'd go to some like hardware store or some lawnmower thing or some wrecking yard or whatever but we were doing the project stuff but I'm along for the ride and I'm, I'm sitting on the back of the motorcycle and we're cruising down the road and I kind of like the motorcycle part it was really fun and I was probably like about seven years old and all of a sudden we like went off the road and into a ditch and then we came up out of the other side and I was just like whoa -ho! That was kind of fun. And, uh, and then we were going in this way and suddenly my dad stopped and he turned around and he sped the other way. I had no idea. I'm sitting in the back. I don't know. I'm just along for the ride. And, and then we got behind this truck and my dad started honking his horn. Now, most motorcycles have these little beep, beep things, but my dad put on air horns. And so that it was like a semi truck and he's burn. And I'm just like going, what's going on here? And then the truck pulled over. And then my, my and, and so the truck pulled over and the guy got out and he was like, what do you want? And then my dad got up and my dad's six, seven, like 300 pounds. And the guy sees him, gets back in the truck, locks the door. And my dad goes up because the guy ran us off the road because we were just a motorcycle and he pulled out in front of us. And my dad was mad because I was on the bike. I knew my dad loved me. And I knew with him I was safe. I always knew that. He was huge. People were afraid of him. It was awesome. You and I have a heavenly father who is bigger and stronger and greater and smarter and wiser 
And he is absolutely competent to save us. And he absolutely cares. One more story. And this, this comes to this faithfulness and it comes to character. So my dad really loved to make us work. Um, and, and so at a young age, you know, and, 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 you know, there was practical stuff, you know, this is the, we'd cut wood. So we had wood to burn. And, and so one of the things we did was we cut all this wood and we'd go for these things. And, you know, and as a seven year old, you're really not excited about this stuff. You know, you, you just want to be at home watching cartoons on Saturday morning. You don't want to be out in the rain hauling wood through the trees, but the one thing that I learned is, is that when we worked hard, we would get little rewards. And, and so one of those things was it, was, it became the tradition. Whenever we went and cut wood, after we were done cutting wood, we'd stop at this little store and we'd get a dad's root beer and corn nuts. And I know it's a small thing, but it was, I mean, I didn't normally get that stuff. And there would be the conversation and there would be the pleasure that my dad had. And he would say, thank you for working hard. And this was a sign of his favor. What is promised is that if we humble ourselves, if we trust God, he will favor us. And this is what I want to invite you into is, is to experience the favor of God. C.S. Lewis, when he talks about the glory of God. He has this wonderful reflection called the weight of glory. And he sits there and he spells it out and he's part of its reputation, part of its, you know, illuminescence. But then he comes down to it and he says, when, it, when you come down to it, to please God, to be a real ingredient in divine happiness, to be loved by God, not merely pitied, but delighted in as an artist delights in his work or a father as in a son, it seems impossible a weight or burden of glory, of thoughts of which we can hardly sustain. But it is true. Your heavenly Father delights in you, and He wants the best for you. And He calls you to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and to live a life of serving love, not as an awful burden, not as an impossible weight to set you free, to give you life, and to show his favor upon you. Will you pray with me? Loving Heavenly Father, you are absolutely good. You want the best for us. You call to us. You seek us. You sent your son, Jesus. Lord Jesus, you, you continually spoke of the goodness and the greatness, and you lived a life of love to your Father, and all of this can be summarized not only as love, but as humility. Because you humbled yourself and you trusted in your Father that he would pick you up. May we choose this way, your way of life. Amen.